Uh, good evening uh, or good morning uh, to all participants. Uh, we have many people uh, who have said that he was going to join this event uh, and they are doing that at that moment. I'm very happy to share this presentation and the later discussion with people from many different parts of the globe. I'm talking to you on behalf of Lingua Lingua Paz International. I am Monica Bremer, the president. Uh, and for those of you that don't know yet our work or our goal, let me tell you that we are an NGO in consultative status with UNESCO, dedicated to the appreciation and protection of linguistic diversity worldwide. We claim that languages express the rich cultural plural pluralism of the human species and are part of the world heritage. And we think as well that languages are equal in dignity beyond the differences between linguistic communities in their demographic, political, economic, and legal aspects. And that its preservation is a major contribution to peace and international understanding. Something to, pick, to keep always in mind and especially at that moment when we can see again in this horrible conflict how languages are used to, to justify unjust unjustifiable decisions or actions and actions. So our major goals uh, are through the analysis of, of changes in social and cultural and political sensitivity in relation to linguistic diversity, to identify the factors that threaten the global linguistic wealth and to promote, along with actions uh, that activate the use of all languages, especially those who are minoritized or endangered, new forms and cultural practices arising from linguistic interactions. In that sense, we pay special attention to the digital access of all languages and to the role of language technologies and its impact on the use of small languages. Technologies, along with education, multilingual education, of course, are key to move uh, successfully towards ideological and political processes aimed at protecting linguistic diversity and improving or revitalizing specific linguistic communities. We work in cooperation with, inter with an international network of delegations in all continents and with a group of experts that are in our advice committee. Collaboration between academics, experts, government officials, educators, journalists, and activists of language rights makes, uh, we are sure about that, uh, our work much more efficient. We also recognize actions carried out in different fields uh, in favor of the preservation of linguistic diversity and the promotion of multilingualism. For that reason, we deliver yearly the International uh, Lingua Pax Award. Its purpose is to identify, value, and disseminate successful actions and good practices around the world that serve as a reference or an example to other communities. This award is, in fact, a tribute to the commitment of individuals or collectives to the promotion of linguistic diversity. And I give you the scope. We will open the next call on the 16th March, and I encourage all of you to nominate people, organizations, or experiences that you think that may deserve this award. You'll be able to find all the information in our website, and we will disseminate through uh, our social network. Uh, but and after the advisor advertisement, uh, let's uh, come back to the topic that got us here today. In 2016, uh, the Lingua Pax Review issue dealt already at that moment with digital media and language revitalization. It was devoted to the potential of new technologies and social networks for linguistic documentation and revitalization and their limits. And today, again, uh, five years after, we present another issue with the title Language Technologies and Language Diversity. The present issue addresses the complexity of the relationship between technology and language diversity from different viewpoints, from the, from the individual to the collective, from the aerial to the global, 
from the native speaker to the language technologies. I'm sure that you'll find it interesting and useful. And before I give the floor to the panel participants, uh, I want to thank very, very strongly the coordinator of the review, Dr. Maite Melero. She is a reference in the field and her vast experience and expertise working for tech companies as a researcher advising governments or making reports such as the one for the European Parliament is a warranty for the for this product quality. Besides, she has managed to offer a wide panorama of this changing and complex topic from the hand of some of the best experts on every perspective. Thank you very much for your work, Maite. And thank you too to the other panelists for your collaboration on the review and for having accepted to be here today, sharing your knowledge with all of us. After your contributions, we will be a bit wiser. Thank you very, very much. And thanks to all the participants, of course, for attending the event. I hope it will be of your interest and that you'll become part of the Lingua Pax growing community very soon. Uh, Ms. Melero, you have the floor. Thank you very much for your kind words, Monica. And I cannot but uh, double thank uh, all the, the, for the generous uh, contributions, uh, the panelists that uh, are with us today, and, and, and also the two authors that are uh, of, the, of, the, of the special issue that uh, uh, cannot uh, attend today's session. Uh, it has really an honor uh, and a pleasure for me to coordinate this issue. And okay, uh, well, it's true that uh, one, as one of the authors uh, uh, correctly pointed out to me some days ago that this panel lacks gender diversity. And also yesterday we celebrated the International Women's Day. Um, this can only be attributed to me <laughs> and my enthusiasm when I, I, I saw the, the brilliant cast of authors that uh, I had on board and I failed to see this, this aspect, which uh, I, I hope you will forgive. You will forgive me for that. Um, and I, I think that uh, um, this lack of gender diversity uh, can certainly be compensated by the diversity of uh, their backgrounds, of their geographical origins, of their languages, and, uh, and of their interests. And because this is mostly about diversity, we are talking about, of course, language diversity, because we at Lingua Pax, as Monica has said, um, we are in love with language diversity. And it's hard for us to admit that uh, seemingly not everybody is in love with language diversity. And this must be a part of the problem because if everybody was as fond of language diversity as we are, as our, our panelists are, and as probably most of our audience uh, today are, then language diversity would not be as threatened as it is nowadays. Um, what can I say about this special issue? Uh, it is a beautiful collection of texts by people who love language diversity and work every day in favor of language diversity. And in this case, with the help of language technologies. We are uh, currently in the middle of a technological revolution, the revolution of artificial intelligence. Some people talk uh, of the fourth industrial revolution. Like previous industrial revolutions, this one is expected to change the way we live, the way we work, the way we interact with one another and perhaps the way we speak. And it's not only the globalization brought about by the internet uh, and the power of global languages, as Daniel Pimienta can tell us, or the threat of extinction for as many as 95% of today's languages, as Andras Kornai famously pointed out already some years ago, but is that technologies, new technologies are invading all aspects of our lives. We'll soon be talking regularly with our machines, the same way we talk to our neighbors. So must we change our language so that machines can understand us? On the other hand, technology has been very effective for language preservation and revitalization as demonstrated by the initiatives uh, brought to us in this issue by Steven Bird, Roland Kuhn, Tunde Adekbola, Suba, 
and Eddie Avila. Most of them are with us today, and I'm going to give them the floor because it is them that we want to listen to. Um, the script for today's session is quite open. I will uh, now ask the panelists in a first round to present themselves, present their projects and current activities, and also talk a little bit about their contribution to this issue. And then we will have a second round of interventions where I will, I will ask them uh, to give their opinion on, on, on some issues. So, and then after this second round, there will be an open discussion with participation from, from the audience uh, via chat. And to, uh, to finish, uh, I am aware that uh, it may seem a contradiction to talk about diversity uh, and endangered languages while we need to use English uh, today and we don't have any interpretation service and English being the global language for excellence. But for the time being and waiting for the universal translator, which we may have seen soon, very, very soon, if, if technology keeps progressing the way it is. But for now, we will need to compromise. I really hope you, you enjoy this uh, to, today's session and also reading the issue. And without further ado, I will give the floor uh, to the panelists, uh, starting with Andras Corney. Um, please, Andras, present yourself. Oh, Andras, you are silenced. You need to unmute your, your phone, your, your microphone. How about now? Good. No, now uh, it's good. <laughs> so I try to be brief because if everybody takes only five minutes, uh, half of the time is already gone. Uh, uh, but I do want to, to, to say a few words about how I, a mathematician, find myself in this. Uh, and um, as um, some of you may know, I'm, I'm a mathematical linguist, which means I'm a mathematician working on ling linguistics so the way other mathematicians work on physics and other parts. So I'm an applied mathematician, basically. Uh, if you want to find out more about this, here is something I strongly suggest you check out. <laughs> uh, um, about 15 years ago, uh, maybe 20 now, uh, I'm also working on, on, on natural language processing technology. So the techno I'm more on the technological uh, side of these, these things than most linguists. And um, a while ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago, I noticed that not only are there like 75% of the papers in computational linguistics about English, uh, and, and then maybe some on French and German and blah, blah, blah. But it was always the same language is recurring. Uh, you know, wherever you went to a conference, a meeting, there was a, uh, 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 you know, like a one or two long guys discussing Russian or, you know, some Spanish, who knows. But typically, uh, uh, it was always the same language is recurring. And I noted that, that Hungarian, which is a... It's not an endangered language, right? This is over 10 million speakers, uh, uh, but it was under-resourced in terms of uh, actual computational devices that, that sort of did Hungarian, it was under-resourced. So I, I, I engaged in a, uh, um, you know, we tried to fill the gap. We first built a big corpus of Hungarian and to build a corpus, we actually, uh, built uh, a crawler infrastructure and everything. And, and once we had this infrastructure, we decided to run it on the neighboring languages, you know, with the area of languages. So, you know, let's see how, how this thing goes in Pol Poland for Polish, how does it go uh, in Romania for Romanian, and so on and so forth. So we started to, and we realized that we are there first. This was very upsetting. I'm not saying this with pride. I'm saying this is that this was very upsetting that, that, that you know, even these languages for which there are full-blown nations, they are really high on some survival, uh, I don't know, parameter list. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm not doing well. So I decided to do a global survey. And the results of the uh, global survey were staggering actually. Uh, uh, so this is this, this, this digital language death paper that many of you have seen that actually is like really, 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 it couldn't be worse. <laughs> so uh, 
uh, uh, at that time, I said that maybe with a little push, 350 languages of the seven or 8,000 uh, that are like counted in the ethnologue and other sources will survive. And now I think it's maybe 200. Uh, it, in 10 years, in spite of all the technological advances that we have seen, uh, uh, this number of, of candidates has not increased. The, the number of new incoming sources is tiny. There is always bright spots here and there, uh, but there is also very dark, dark uh, 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 spots everywhere. So um, what I'd like to call attention to and this is basically my main contribution to this special issue other than the, the, the foreword, is that I would like to call everybody's uh, attention uh, 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 to this paper by Linda Braun and, 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 and others uh, in, in Nature Ecology and Evolution, which uh, measured a set of parameters which are almost entirely on orthogonal to the kind of parameters that we used in our study. So there are some common, like the number of, uh, uh, of native speakers. So obviously they are not totally disjoint parameter sets, but largely, and they use ecological methods and they bring to light a very, very important truth, which is that the phenomenon is aerial. So uh, uh, this should have been evident to us it's just from seeing what's happening in Romanian and Polish and Slovak and all these languages that uh, in one area, uh, these languages are about at the same rung of the ladder, so to speak. They are about showing the same amount of resource uh, resources. By the way, uh, just last week, there was a new paper on archive about Turkish. Again, it's a major nation, big uh, industrial power, even military power. Uh, you know, Turkey is, is, is a big deal and Turkish, you know, these guys are coming to the same conclusion that Turkish is under-resourced when it comes to computational linguistics. So we need to do stuff. And uh, what this, this Brahman paper brings to light is that the phenomenon of language death is also aerial. So there are large geographic areas in which this is happening. You know, you go to the Amazon basin and all these Amazonian Indian languages are sort of dying out together. You go to North America, Canada border, uh, and all those languages are again dying out together. So this is a big deal, which cannot simply be attributed to like hostile intentions of, of, of nation states. Cause like the Canadians are really trying to do everything within their power to, to, to improve the situation. So, so there is something that we need to look at. I think this is, not so different actually from some sort of environmental poisoning. The environment doesn't know, you know, uh, these chemicals, they don't know national boundaries. It's, uh, you know, uh, once it's out, it's out and it's, it's, it's going everywhere. So on this less than cheerful note, let me pass over the microphone to uh, who is coming next. Next is coming Daniel Pimienta. Uh... Daniel. Uh, bonjour tout le monde, saludos, uh, salut, hello, salam, shalom. Um, maybe I will start about some uh, origin of mine. I was born in Morocco, then in Africa. I moved to France in Nice when I was uh, a teenager. And uh, after studying and working in, uh, in South of France, I moved to Santo Domingo and I became a Latin American and a Caribbean. So diversity is part of my uh, trajectory of life. Like Andreas, I am a mathematician, and like him, I am not a linguist. I am more um, maybe telling you how I came to the, the interest on language diversity, beside my origin, which is a mix. Uh, I work uh, for half of my professional life as a system architect in IBM on telecommunication. And one day I decided to change uh, life and profession and I went to live in uh, Santo Domingo, Republica Dominicana. When I started an NGO, I became a civil society uh, player on the field of ICT for development, information and communication technology for development, translate it into try to have people connected to the internet 
which was by that time, the 80s, a real utopia, which have changed a lot now. So I work mainly not on language, but on ICT for development, on trying to being a champion, to have people connected to the internet. And very, very soon I understand that it was not only a question of access. The digital divide is not only a question of access, it's a question of content. And if it is content, the content divide is a linguistic divide. And one year, I think it was on 87 or 88, the president of France, Chirac, who was in a summit of francophonie with a very aggressive discourse against internet, saying that internet was entirely an English speaking uh, place. And I get mad and I try to get data on the reality of language on the internet. That was one of my side uh, activity, professional activity by that time, and progressively become one of my main activity, trying a very big challenge, by the way, trying to measure the space of language on the internet and discovering in the 90s and rediscovering now that there is a lot of disinformation about this reality. If I ask to the 63 participants, how many, how, how about you? What do you think is the space of English on the internet? You will probably answer me, all of you, above 50%. Why I am measuring less than 25%. The internet has been changing very strongly in the last 10 years. It has moved from the European original language, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and so on, including Hungarian, into Asiatic language and Arabic. The center of gravity of the internet has been moving very fast and people because of this information still believe that everybody speak English. When in reality, less than 20% of the world population understand English. There is a lemma from internet society, which is very old saying, it's for everybody. Well, if internet is for everybody, internet have to speak the language of everybody. If not, we're gonna to go to acculturation of people using other languages than mother tongue on the internet. So the paper I wrote for uh, the, this issue of lingua pass is about the state of the art of our study about the space of language on the internet. So I will now leave the, uh, the place for the next speaker. Thanks, Daniel. So Tunde uh, Adekbola, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, bonjour, uh, good nachmittag, konbanwa, whatever. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm Roland Kuhn <laughs> from uh, the National Research Council of Canada, and I'm a uh, lead okay. of a project we call the Indigenous Languages Technology Project. Now, if you look, if you look at the paper in Lingua Pax Review describing the project, you'll get the impression it's kind of chaotic. Like the, we're doing a bunch of different activities, but there's a good reason for that. We decided when we got funding for this project that instead of imposing a sort of top-down vision, we go to uh, what we call indigenous language activists, mainly but not entirely teachers, and ask them what software do you need that would help you in your activity. And of course, the needs differ from community to community. So it's kind of a complicated paper because we did a bunch of different things. But the, the thing I'd like to emphasize that I think is really cool that for instance, Dr. Kornai might be interested in is um, there are 10 or according to some linguists, 11 different language families, uh, indigenous languages in Canada um, and somewhere between 70 or 90 to 90 languages. Um, the usual argument about, you know, are these two different dialects or these two different languages? We won't go into that. But anyway, the point is these languages are there are at least 10 groupings of unrelated languages, and yet most of them are polysynthetic. In fact, I think all but one of the families. So the, a lot of what we've done is related to that, and it's very interesting. So for me, the most interesting part of our project is it turned out several communities, educators, wanted verb conjugators because learning the verbs in these languages um, is even harder than learning Hungarian verbs, which I always heard was 
the most tough thing to learn in European languages. Maybe Finnish or Estonian, same family, I don't know. But anyway, these languages are very verb oriented and verb conjugations are very uh, important for teaching. So one of our big sub projects is modeling uh, those verb conjugations in software to help teaching. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Roland. Uh, so now to the other Bola. Hello. Um, really gratifying to be here. Um, my name is Tunde Adebola. Well, I started life as an electrical engineer. Then I went into computer science and ended up in information science, studying language as an information system. Um, I work at African Languages Technology Initiative. And what we do is try to ensure that uh, Africans can live in the information, global information society without having to learn uh, a different language and having to use uh, a foreign language. For us, one, two important features of the information age is that there is now a need for humans to communicate through machines and two, a need for humans to communicate with machines. So the question then is, is it, will all the machines that we communicate with one another through, will they be available? Will they be able to use all the languages of the world? Will, will every language of the world be, uh, be made, uh, the, will the machines be made capable of accommodating all the languages of the world in people communicating with people? And two, in people communicating with machines, can we ensure that nobody is made to learn another language in order to live in the information society productively? So these are the uh, problems that we try to solve. And we, there, from there, we see two important challenges. The first challenge is to build machines that take advantage of the commonalities in all languages, because all languages have some level of commonalities. So we want to be able to take advantage of that in building machines. Number, the second one is that languages have peculiarities. So we want to also build machines that are aware of the peculiarities of uh, many languages. And one important aspect of this that we see in the way technology has evolved is that a lot of the work in human language technology is based on the availability of historical data. And for many uh, communities in the world, the means by this by which this historical data is naturally accumulated into big data that, that enable the development of language technologies are not available. Many languages are not used in domains that produce uh, big data. So we, that was a problem I was uh, addressing in my mind too. Uh, how can we ensure that uh, all the languages of the world are used, or at least as many languages as possible in the world, are used in domains in which uh, data footprints are accumulated to present to machines as learning resources. So what we find therefore is that the so-called digital divide presents yet another problem in, uh, uh, as it were, complicating the capacity to solve, to, 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 to bridge the digital divide. So we have a kind of chicken and egg problem in which uh, do we, how do we get data available to build uh, machines and processes that will make more data available? So that, these are the uh, 
uh, kind of problem that we see. But more importantly, is the fact of uh, diversity, the fact that uh, language is a genetic feature. There's, a, there's an inbuilt language capacity in every human being. But more importantly, uh, language also implicates uh, genomics. That is genomics being, in a way, the language that generations yet unborn are communicated with. So all that we have, what, all that we do today, the way our bodies, the way our genes ad ad adapt themselves to the environment are passed on to our children in such, and many, many generations ahead of us in a way that we kind of um, forewarn our children yet unborn that these are the elements of adversities and positivities that you are going to experience in the world. So for that reason, I see genomics as a language that human beings use to communicate with many, many generations ahead of time, generations that they do not have a, 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 a vital um, interaction with. So in that sense, what I now find is that there will be many uh, problems in the world that can learn from the way we humans have accommodated and adapted evolutionarily with language. And if we do not maintain linguistic diversity, we will lose some of these very, very important resources that we have naturally evolved over eons, millennia, that have become practical and have provided really important solutions to our uh, interaction within our environment, within other elements of uh, the environment, of, of our ecosystem, the way we have adapted to live productively and uh, with integrity with our uh, natural environment. So it is from this point of view that I was looking at the problems that may arise from the inability of certain linguistic communities of the world from producing big data to the extent that, uh, like was earlier said, I think by Ronald Kuhn or by uh, Konari, Konai, sorry, that all the information we have today, all the knowledge we have today, all the inputs we have applied into the whole uh, issue of a uh, um, genetic science, um, uh, no, uh, cognitive science rather, are based on about 30 to 50 languages out of 7,000. And we are now making, we are now attempting to make generalizations about the state of the human mind based on just 50 out of 7,000 languages. That to me is what statisticians refer to as convenience sampling. And we know all the weaknesses of convenience sampling. Let's, let me stop there for now. Thank you, Tunde. You have given us a master's lesson on why diversity, language diversity is important. <laughs> so we don't need to go into the second round. Uh, we uh, give the floor now to Suba Panigrahi. Thank you so much, Matt, and uh, hi, everyone. My name is Subhashish. Um, I'm based in uh, India, and uh, I'm not a linguist. Um, I'm actually an engineer by training, and I developed interest in languages uh, as, a, as a young person when I was a student. Um, I come from a place where my community uh, is the dominant community, and there are several um, indigenous communities that also live in the, in the in the small town where I'm from. And as a, as a, as a child um, in a family of teachers, I saw how 
uh, there is discrimination in many levels. Uh, it's not just in upbringing uh, by parents, but also uh, in society and uh, in schools, uh, so in education system uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, I never got to learn the languages um, of my neighbors. Uh, on the other hand, they were forced to learn my language. And, um, and I think that that was uh, sort of a lived experience of how uh, cultural genocide, uh, I was reading the chat and <laughs> it just triggered uh, what I saw as a, as a young person in my own life, uh, the cultural genocide that is uh, carried upon um, in many places, in many different forms. And, uh, and as I grew up, um, I, uh, I, I had this interest in uh, technology to begin with, and I uh, was trying to uh, get my head around Unicode. And that was, um, that was when I discovered basically that there are many languages that don't have any writing system to begin with. And my language is privileged to have uh, Unicode standard um, for the writing system that we have. Um, so uh, in 2011, I uh, started contributing to Wikipedia um, and uh, that was sort of my own, uh, the beginning of my own journey uh, into the language technology world. Uh, and I started contributing to Wikipedia in my own language and the project was kind of uh, uh, almost dormant. There were hardly any contribution at that time. And uh, others, uh, a few other uh, friends and I uh, basically revived that project. Um, which now has uh, more than 15,000 articles. Also the largest uh, compendium of knowledge in the language that is available with an open license. Uh, so that was also, uh, Wikipedia was also my introduction uh, uh, to openness. Um, and I, I learned to understand what it really means to release uh, any kind of content, uh, be it text, be it audio or video, uh, in, uh, under an open license and how it really matters uh, over the years. If the impact of openness is not visible um, immediately, how it is really important for any, uh, for any kind of linguistic content. Um, so, so I think as an engineer, um, I have a small philosophy in life, uh, which is uh, I practice more than I preach, uh, meaning when I'm, uh, when I'm saying uh, things that people, uh, for other people, uh, that this uh, should be done, done and that should be done, I also try to practice something uh, in my own life, in my own personal life. So um, I'm currently working on a project around voice data. Uh, so before I start to preach, and I'm actually writing uh, right now about uh, the process and why voice data is important. And as we're talking about technology and is, uh, how it's developing really, really fast, um, uh, I'm, I basically worked on a project uh, to record pronunciations of about uh, 55,000 um, words uh, and about 4,000 sentences uh, using two different projects. Um, Mozilla's uh, Common Voice uh, for sentences and Lingua Libre, which is connected to the Wikimedia Commons, uh, a sister project of Wikipedia uh, for the words. Uh, so I'm writing that process and uh, what some of the low resource languages could do uh, in terms of not just creating uh, libraries of voice data, but also building strategy and, and uh, equipping other people uh, and also harvesting the skills that different people uh, have. Some people might be able to uh, engage communities and teach other people and some people might be actually donate their voice. Uh, but uh, in essence, what's really uh, important is, uh, is that communities uh, have to create uh, voice data or any kind of linguistic data, but they can just do that by volunteering. And that's very important. Many open source communities uh, often talk about volunteering and volunteering is not the same in different contexts. In some places, uh, people have uh, literally no affordability for uh, donating volunteer labor. And that's a very, very important uh, aspect um, in, in societies across the world. Um, so, so I think when half of my career uh, I have spent talking about open source and, uh, and communities that contribute to open source as volunteers, 
uh, now I'm sort of taking many steps back to figure out uh, maybe I preached too much. Uh, maybe there are other organizations, uh, other civil society actors that preached too much, uh, talking about volunteerism, but not talking about how important it is to, uh, to recognize that it is not a universal thing. It, it doesn't mean the same in, in say, Europe uh, or North America, and it doesn't mean the same in Southeast Asia or Africa. Uh, it, it really comes at a cost. People sometimes don't have the, the same level of access to technology or the same level of access to the internet. And uh, they, the know-how that is required to contribute to many projects is not the same. Um, so it is really important that different stakeholders have to uh, work in different levels. Some, um, sometimes the governments don't have any funding and sometimes the governments don't fund civil society um, organizations to develop, uh, say, a speech corpus or a word corpus. So there, there is also a need to kind of create content and build that ecosystem so that there's more investment from the private sector. And I think the strategy uh, to, um, to not just um, sustain languages, but also ensure that languages are growing and they're being used actively because that's the sole purpose of any language. Languages are not supposed to be kept in archives um, as recordings, but they are supposed to be used by uh, the human society. So I think um, that that is uh, one aspect that, um, that has to be discussed more. Uh, strategies and, and plans have to be built around, um, around those challenges. Um, I started a project called Open Speaks in 2017. Uh, so the article that I have written in LinguaPax is, uh, is about that and how um, open strategies and uh, open documentations are important and how open educational resources are really, really vital for uh, many uh, uh, language, archi uh, language archivists and language activists in general to, to learn. Um, in most places uh, where, where there's uh, contribution and there's documentation of uh, languages, there's little documentation about the, the how part, uh, how anyone can actually uh, document their own language or the languages that are around them and why it's important to document. Um, the sole purpose of this particular um, event uh, is also around that, I believe. And I think uh, th there's a lot uh, of solidarity that I see in the works of many people um, here in the panel, but also uh, those who are uh, participating. Um, and uh, and Open Speaks is basically uh, a sort of a open educational resource. It lives on um, Wikiversity, which is a sister project of Wikipedia, and it is of course available in, under open license. Um, and uh, what it has is it has uh, sort of several uh, processes which are essential for uh, language archivists to learn and and use. Uh, it has templates. It has uh, some strategies. It also has frameworks so that they can place themselves in the uh, landscape of um, language documentation as audio and video. And, uh, um, and I think the, the article sort of, um, the article that I've written for LinguaPax kind of summarizes uh, all of that. Um, and uh, I'm in the process of um, reviving um, OpenSpeaks in many ways because a friend of mine um, uh, and I start to look at the accessibility challenges that many contributors face, many archivists face. Um, so, and, and that uh, made us realize that we haven't covered much about that aspect, how uh, people with, with different forms of disabilities have different challenges in learning languages or communicating using their own language on the internet and uh, using digital uh, platforms. Uh, so we're working, uh, we started working on that last year and uh, we probably were gonna work a little bit this year. Um, so that's, that's gonna be the future of that project. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, Maite uh, and others for inviting me here. Thank you, Suba. And let's see if, if our last panelist, Eddie Avila, uh, has encountered similar challenges in his part of the world. Yes, hi, I'm, I'm Eddie Avila. I'm connecting from Cochabamba, Bolivia. And I work with the organization Global Voices through the Rising Voices Initiative. And one of our main projects with Rising Voices has been uh, language digital activism. And you know, we sort of loosely defined 
language digital activism as leveraging the internet, digital technologies, digital media to affect uh, change. And in many cases, the, the, the change can be really wide ranging, whether it's just simply creating more content online in that language, whether it's trying to uh, change attitudes towards you know, uh, groups uh, maintaining the language, attracting young people to take up the language and to keep the language, um, and also maybe raise awareness. Um, and I think even though we talk about digital activism, sometimes I feel like it's a misnomer because so much emphasis is on the digital part, technology, internet, but in fact, it's really about the individual who are using those tools. Um, and I think um, you know many of the activists we work with around the world, especially here in Latin America, but also in other parts of the world, they really do take a pragmatic approach to their work. You know, very few are, are linguists, very few are computer programmers. Uh, the vast majority do so on a volunteer basis, just because they want to do something for the language. They don't want to wait around for the government, an NGO, the university to start working with the language, but they're really taking it very much a do-it-yourself approach where they just dive right in. Maybe they're not writing 100% you know, agreed upon the way the language is, can be written, but I think waiting until that point is valuable time. And so I've been working in this field with digital activism for 15 years now. And it's sort of similar to, sometimes they say, you know, one human year is seven dog years, but I think there's also internet years. And so 15 years is a long time in relative, you know, relative terms with the internet. And so in that time, has digital activism, has this work with technology really moved the needle? Has it made an impact? Has it made a change? And I think it's all of that is really very much relative. Um, you know, I think we've gone past the idea of, you know, on social media, whether the number of views, number of likes, number of followers really cannot tell the whole story about what someone is doing is having a, a change. And I think, you know, I heard from, from a friend of mine in Mexico who had an online radio program uh, and they also live streamed on Facebook and just so, sort of her disappointment seeing, um, you know, maybe 10 people connected or, or and just not really knowing what that really means. But I think it's all about also, you know, finding ways to find, you know, I think it could potentially be 10 people who um, really found inspiration in that and really wanted to make a change because of seeing others like that person moving their language forward. And so I think there's ways to start thinking about, you know, how this digital activism is having an impact in the real world. You know, I think a lot of these platforms really have a gold mine of data of, of knowing who's using the language, uh, where they're connecting from. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, we don't have access to that. And so we must find ways to support the activists to be able to decide for themselves what it means to have an impact um, and, and what it means to make a change with their work. And, and it's not so much, you know, to make an impact in terms of maybe NGO speak or development speak, but rather because, you know, most of them are working, you know, on a volunteer basis in their free time, putting their own resources in, that there is a limited amount of resources and time. And I think they'd like to know whether what they're doing is having some sort of impact, whether it's the right strategy, whether it's the right channel, whether they're, right, they're using the right tools. Um, so I think in that sense, that's why we find it's really important to help have these conversations with them, help them ask the right questions. Because again, with the changes are so, so different that it's hard to make a, a common framework to, to incorporate all the changes. And obviously many other factors go into that. And so, you know, all of our work has never been about, you know, techno utopianism, about the internet and digital media is gonna save languages, but it's rather one part of a, a larger strategy. But I think over the years, we've seen anecdotal evidence, we've seen observation, and just by knowing the individuals on a personal basis, we've seen what they're doing and it's really making a change. But how do we articulate that? How do we support them be able to articulate what that really means? Um, and because, you know, 
as uh, even before the pandemic, we've seen a lot of burnout. We've seen a lot of questioning about this work that we want, hopefully these activists to feel like they're making a positive change. And again, my opinion is that they are, but I think sometimes it's, 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 it's important to convince them as well. Um, and that's part of what we try to do with Rising Voices is to amplify their work, highlight their work, connect them with others. Um, and you know, we think we've been really, really fortunate over the last 15 years to get to know hundreds of young people, of digital activists who are really taking this approach and also working with really great partners we've met along the way, Lingua Packs we've worked with before. And, and I saw Hana from Living Tongues, who we've also worked with before. So I think that's what make this a very much a sort of village-like support system for these activists, because it is hard. You know, it can be very frustrating. It can be demoralizing at some times. But I think if there's finding commonalities in building these networks of peers, maybe that they work in different language, but they still have a very common ex lived experience. And that's, that's sort of what we're trying to do is facilitate those spaces where they could meet others who are working similar so they have that mutual support and then they could have that uh, the, the, the energy to, be continue, to continue on and, and also replicate their work for the next generation to continue after them. And so I think that's basically what we, we try to come across an article about how do we support the activists so that they can uh, evaluate for themselves what it means to have an impact in their work as more and more digital activism happens around the world. Thanks. Thank you, Eddie. I think that everything you said now and, and, and what you wrote in the, in the, in the Lingua Pax review is very inspirational. And, and I think that, uh, well, I'm going to change a little bit the script of this session because uh, uh, you have touched upon uh, many of the issues or the main issues that uh, we, we intended to discuss. Uh, but I, I'm willing to give a second round because uh, we are, uh, we, we, we would be, we would like to, to, to stay here and listen to you for hours. <laughs> but uh, yeah, resources are limited and time is limited. But um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to ask Katyusha if there are uh, specific questions from the audience that uh, she can, can you read? Uh, some of the, if, if there are any specific questions to the, to the panelists or just comments, and, and then yes, we are we going have... to give the, the uh, a second round of, of uh, Okay, yes, uh, we don't have specific, or I don't see any specific question, but yes, some, some comments. Maybe it's interesting to speak about the um, ethical issues raised by language documentation. I don't know if you want to to deal with this issue. Okay, that's and there it. Were, there uh, was also a small debate about uh, the situation in Canada uh, and the schools where people was forced or so with violence to speak the dominant languages. These are the main issues I, I can see in the chat. Okay, so I'm going to, to give the floor to Andres again. And then we are going to go quickly uh, on a second and last round. You have to unmute. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, sorry. Um, so uh, I would like to inject something that that is may not seem as exactly mainline to this discussion, uh, which is the situation in the Ukraine uh, that many of you are no doubt following in in great detail. Uh, and I know that some of some of us in the in, in the panel are actually trying to do something something in various uh, ways. Uh, Ukrainian again, it's like Hungarian. It's not an endangered language by any any <clears throat> any you know reasonable measure. However, at this point, there is an active propaganda effort uh, going on to to pretend that it's not a language to basically. Uh, I don't know, uh, dismantle the national identity and tell these people that they, they don't know, no, no, they are just speaking a dialect of Russian and they are really Russians. And I would like to ask people offline after this, 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 this meeting, if anybody has serious scientific uh, evidence, dialectologists, I, this, is, this is Slavicists, uh, people with expertise in these things, 
to help us counter this kind of uh, propaganda that is going on these days. So that's that's. I'm really sorry that that uh, you know uh, we don't want Ukrainian to be be endangered as a language. So thank you so much. I'm I'm passing on the uh, mic. Thank you, Andras. Uh, Daniel. Yeah, I, I really will stick on the first uh, sweep question, but uh, trying to be extremely brief on each one. Why should we care about linguistic diversity? The public in general is extremely sensitive to biological diversity. When you say that this particular species is going to disappear, people feel sad. But they do not understand that it's the same for language. Language are also part of the ecological situation of the world. The world is a complex system, and there is a mathematical theorem about a complex system, which is called the HB theorem, which explains that there is a, a grade of variety which is required for complex system to survive. It seems very theoretical, but it is easy to understand intuitively. Complex system like humanity are divided. One is homeostasy, which is how we remain the same, and another one, the capacity to change that genetical mutation. So the, the HB theorem is just saying that if you don't have enough variety, enough language, enough biological species, when something which so this is exactly the same discourse and Tunde was seeing minutes before, but trying to give it a mathematical background. So the linguistic diversity is as much important for the Earth than biological diversity. And probably today, it is still more threatened than biological diversity. And why do we care about linguistic diversity on the internet, which is another part of the subject? Because the impact of not being represented equally to the people on the real world on the internet have very strong implications, which are not only cultural, also economic. I will just tell Liza for the first question. Is our new technology a threat or an opportunity? language. Everything on the internet is ambivalent. So the answer again is ambivalent. Yes, it is a threat, and yes, it is an opportunity, both together. It is a threat because it will decrease the will to use the language if your language is not represented on the games, on the social platform, and so on. So it can accelerate the separation of language. It is an opportunity, and we lead to the third question, if champions are capable to walk and put your own, your mother tongue on the internet. So I go to the third question, and it will be all, also very fast. What are the keys for effective language digital activism? Many answers have been given already by our colleague, Eddie. I have been for 30 years a, a digital activist working for trying to push the internet in developing countries. And I think the main lesson I learned is the importance of champions. You need people, organization, capable to move the obstacle. You need people with a will very strong so they will move away and push their objective. All the history of the internet growing have been an history of champions. And I think for language, it is the same, but it is not the only requirement. There is a second requirement, and I think Eddie explained it very well. It is the importance of involving stakeholders and fostering participation. You cannot alone change the world, and alone be a leader and provide leadership and momentum. But you need to have the people who are concerned by the problem involved in the solution. Because if they are not involved, you will not move. There is a specific difficulties with language and the mechanism of uh, digital activism. It is a discussion, the correl between linguists, 
about no this is uh, the good language no this is not the good language and many times this difficulty of language to have a consensus is a very strong obstacle and these people need to understand that the stakes are so high that they have have to compromise. They have to compromise and accept that there are different variety of language behind the same name. And if they need to put a written version of the language, they need to compromise. And the last point I want to say, which is also the lesson learned by 30 years of activism, you need to conciliate, which is not an easy game, utopia with pragmatism. So the difficulty to be a digital activist is to remain utopist and to be extremely pragmatic at the same time, which is a very complex acrobacy. I don't want to take more time, so I leave other people explain. Thank you for, for a good summary, Daniel. Uh, so Roland, uh, you want to? Yeah, want actually to Daniel said something I've seen on the ground very often in Canada, the importance of local language champions. There's several communities we've had the honor of interacting with in Canada where um, the language is being revived by or strengthened by local indigenous language activists, often not professional, certainly usually not linguists, not computer scientists, but smart people who work very hard to bring their language back. And the second point, uh, why diversity is important in Canada anyway, there's some evidence, well, there's strong evidence that communities that have a strong language revitalization program tend to have fewer social problems. Now, like, because some of these indigenous communities have a lot of social problems, as you might expect, given, given the dramatic past that was discussed in the chat. Now, of course, as a scientist, I tell myself, is this, I ask myself, is this correlation or causation? Maybe the strong communities are the communities that are stronger anyway are more likely to have language revitalization activities. But I have to say, anecdotally, I can't prove it scientifically, but from what I've observed, I think learning one's ancestral language for an indigenous person in Canada is strengthens morale, strengthens community cohesion, um, strengthens pride. Um, it tends to have all kinds of beneficial side effects. I can't prove it. It could just be correlation. But I personally believe in the Canadian context, the strengthening and revitalization of Indigenous languages has a tremendously positive uh, social effect in communities that have been traumatized. So that's all I'll say. Thanks, Roland. Um, Tunde? Uh... Adek Bola. Yes, please. Um, yes, um, as, as to the question of why should we worry about uh, linguistic diversity, first of all, we must recognize the emotional dimension, which may not be that important, but is also important that people uh, express a kind of uh, cultural nationalism. Our own uh, must not die. Uh, we should retain our own. We should be who we are. We should not be colored by other people's thought forms, but it goes beyond that into, into the whole area of livelihoods because every livelihood is based on negotiation interaction, which depends fundamentally on information exchange and information depends foundationally on language. So uh, people are bound to become uh, marginalized politically, economically, socially and in very many ways if their languages become uh, compromised. So from that point of view, uh, it is very important. Uh, and I've, I've got to agree with uh, Daniel about the relationship with um, uh, biological diversity and linguistic diversity. And I add that what makes the material diversity, the, the material elements of biological diversity, it is language that acts as it were, like the software that gives vitality to the material reality, because uh, the, 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 the diverse species are there, but if we do not know what they are useful for, then 
the, their use is not, maximum use is not taken. And it is language that provides this vital software element to that hardware that is uh, ma the material reality. Um, talking about um, um, activism, I'll say first and, for, first and foremost, it's, it's um, any sort of activism towards linguistic diversity must always, first of all, get the speaker communities, one, interested and then involved. There are many speaker communities that have a kind of um, a low esteem of their languages. Uh, they kind of prefer the foreign language that has become the language of education, the language of administration, the language of opportunities, and they kind of feel that their own languages are inferior to these languages because they are the languages of, of opportunity. So the first thing in uh, linguistic uh, diversity activism is to get speaker communities interested and involved. Demonstrate the connection between the survival of language and the survival and livelihoods and show how technology can enhance language. As to the question of what will technology do to linguistic diversity, the answer is, it, it, it technology has always presented that possibility of going either way. It can either enhance linguistic diversity or it can uh, obliterate uh, many languages. It all depends on the way we understand it and the way we use technology. Uh, and needless to say that we should see technology as a very, very vital uh, aspect of uh, maintaining linguistic diversity. Let me stop there. Thank you very much, Tunde. Um, Subhashish, your turn. Um, thank you, Maite. Um, I'll quickly go directly to the questions uh, and answer. Um, the first one, which is uh, why we should care about linguistic diversity. And I think um, many before me have uh, emphasized enough that language is part of the human identity. And um, it is also important that uh, we treat languages the same way we treat um, species. I think uh, Daniel uh, made that very, very clear for all of us that uh, survival and, and growth of languages is as important as the ecological balance. Um, and I think from a very so social uh, aspect, uh, it's also very important that uh, people have equitable access to information in their own language, and they also have um, equitable participation uh, in, in different kinds of uh, discourse uh, through their language. And that's the only way that uh, we could ensure some amount of uh, equity in, in, in a society where people don't discriminate others based on uh, the languages that other people speak. Um, so I think from that perspective, it's very, very important um, that we all care about the linguistic diversity, uh, just the way we care about diversity in general, uh, in any form that could be uh, gender-based diversity, that could be diversity in uh, pay, uh, diversity in recognition of labor, uh, and all forms of uh, human rights uh, to be begin with. And linguistic rights are human rights. Uh, so, so that's... Um, that's the reason uh, that that part is very, very important. The second question uh, about the new technologies and what role they would play um, in, in the, uh, in the uh, context of the threats of language disappearance or uh, the way languages are going extinct. Um, well, I think um, Eddie made this point very, very clear today and, and in many other contexts before. Uh, by the way, I also contribute to Rising Voices uh, as a volunteer. Um, that uh, lang language, sorry, the, the, the language technology or technology in general that uh, could be used to, uh, to serve uh, language communities has to always be treated as a tool uh, and not the other way. Languages uh, are part of human society and, and it's very, very important to keep 
humans in the center, people in the center and societies in center and not technology in the center. If technologies could be, uh, if, if, the, if the importance for technology takes over the importance of people, then uh, we get to see um, the techno utopian uh, forms. Uh, and then I think Eddie uh, talked about that uh, today as well. So, so I think it's, um, it could be a threat. Uh, technologies could be a threat. Uh, there could be an opportunity depending on the context, the way they are used. Um, and, uh, and, and there's, there's no one uh, sort of answer to that. It is, uh, it is very, very contextual uh, for different languages and for different uh, uh, demographics and so on. Um, the third question, uh, the, the effective language digital activism. Um, well, I think it is in a way, my, my stand in a way is uh, an answer to what uh, Joseph um, highlighted about uh, people that are not native speakers playing the role of archiv uh, activism, uh, activists and archivists. Uh, when that happens and uh, people that are not native speakers document languages and uh, also own the materials. And uh, people that are native speakers don't have access to that material. And I think that creates not just a new form of uh, colonial practice, but also extends the discrimination on societies that already exist. And these, society, these discriminations are basically uh, furthered by use of technology and by use of uh, different digital archives. So, so I think that is a very, very, important aspect to uh, be considered by people that are not native speakers of different indigenous and other low resource languages, uh, which, uh, which could partly be addressed by releasing the material under open access uh, so that there is no uh, uh, paywall for people to access the content in their own language. And especially when their language doesn't have enough documentation, the language is at risk. It is very important that the community, uh, the native speakers have uh, enough access to all the data that has been captured in the past um, and that, that that data contains the linguistic data of their own community. Um, so I'll stop there, um, but thank you for um, giving this opportunity. Thank you. And Eddie, uh, you will have uh, the opportunity to close this round and this debate. Great, thanks. Uh, I'll jump right in number two. I think everyone is gave a really great answers on number one. Um, in terms of challenges and threats uh, presented by technology, like it's, you know, I wouldn't be working where I am now if I didn't think it was an opportunity for language technologies to have an effect. <clears throat> I think maybe threats, I would maybe uh, kind of reframe that as challenges. It, it reminds me of a friend here in Bolivia working with Aymara language, which has a million speakers around the region who said, he was doing what he was doing because he didn't want the next generation of speakers to find the same void and content that he found when he was younger. And so he's thinking about working for the next generation. But I know many other languages <coughs> may not have as many speakers and resources. And so there could be a threat when a young person who discovers the internet for the first time and looks for their language or culture online, if they don't see anything, that could either, either further push them away. You know, it could be a really, it sends the message like, oh, my language isn't important enough to be um, you know, online. And especially with content that they find interesting. And I think we've seen very many examples of comic books in, in, in indigenous languages, uh, you know, popular movie clips dubbed, um, you know, now there's football games, uh, uh, announcers calling football games in indigenous languages. So I think those types of things can really uh, attract young people. But if someone doesn't find that right away, it could be a really, you know, a very strong message like that their language isn't important. So I think it's a tall, tall, tall task to continue to, to work towards that. And then for the third, I think uh, really great answers from the rest of the panel. Um, I think something that I'm sure Suba knows really well about in terms of sort of the Wikimedia movement, but also digital activism, where I said a lot of the activists are volunteers using their own resources, um, you know, there is a privilege of volunteering. It's very, very pronounced between different parts of the world where 
you know, that they, they don't have internet at home, they may not have internet at work, you know, they may have other needs to take care of. And, you know, that could be a very big barrier to digital activists. And I, I'm really, you know, uh, hopeful to see many funding organizations providing, you know, small grants to speakers. And I know many of documentation uh, programs are also uh, uh, giving a bigger focus on native speakers, community speakers, because I think in a way, uh, teaching people to document languages, to use technology is, is maybe much easier than teaching a documentarian to learn a native language and know the context. So I think finding the ways to support uh, activists, whether so that maybe they're not needing to, uh, you know, take out of their own pocket to buy internet. So I think even the small scale funding has a big impact on many communities. And hopefully more and more of opportunities will be available as you know, we start the international decade of indigenous languages. Maybe there's more uh, opportunities to support speakers in that way. Um, so, so it's not either a big grant or, or no grant, but something in the middle where it can be make a big difference. Thanks. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, well, we, we have uh, reached the, the end of the of this uh, session today. Uh, you have touched upon a number of very, very interesting uh, subjects and, and we could still be uh, talking and, and listening to you for hours. It has been really, really a privilege. I thank you very, very much.